With the recent release of AC6, we'd like to go over this product in depth with you, starting with a quick overview of the whole Adaptive platform. Adaptive is not just another line array. It's infinitely scalable and virtually limitless in its applications. It hangs straight, uses shorter array heights, needs less boxes for coverage areas, and can adapt to almost any requirement. Reducing destructive reflections means there will be increased intelligibility and a more direct sound experience. Adaptive strength and improving directivity lies with its driver density and ability to be easily scaled. This is what allows for shorter line lengths. Its scalability also allows for noise control most other systems cannot accomplish. The more cells available for allocation, the more control you will have. When we add more sources to our line and have the ability to control each one individually, we can now start to form more complex directivity patterns. By digitally manipulating delay between each device, we can narrow, widen, and direct energy in any way we like. Let's move on to what's inside one of the cabinets. We're looking at Anya in this example. Engineering designed a system of staggered apertures, creating two lines of components to reduce the center-to-center -center spacing to one inch, allowing for extremely precise directivity control. EAW developed a new neo-magnet structure for the high-frequency drivers that allowed for very high motor strength in a compact package. We also created new tooling to build a structure to be integrated with companion drivers, what we call the engine or manifold, which is pictured here on the slide. The result is a staggered 14-element source 35mm voice coil, aluminum diaphragm high-frequency drivers with high output, high power handling, and excellent sound character. Concentric Summation Array, CSA technology, was engineered to minimize and randomize the size, shape, and location of the mid-frequency apertures to present minimal impact on the high-frequency wavefront, as well as optimizing the transition. The technology works on the premise of the 80% fill rule. Ideally, the high-frequency wavefront travels along a solid surface, but that does not help us to integrate the mid-range into a common horn throat. Testing revealed that as long as the high-frequency sees a continuous surface, that is at least 80% solid material, the impact to the high-frequency wave is minimized. As the high-frequency wavefront exits the compression drivers, and as it makes its way across the baffle, cutouts open and close in their diamond-shaped pattern, so that as one group of the diamonds open, another begins to close. This method guarantees that the high-frequency will see no less than 20% discontinuity of solid surfaces as it passes over the entire face of the horn. Cutouts that present greater than 20% discontinuity will create reflective and modulated interference to the high frequency. Adaptive can also improve overall coverage in most venues. These images show the same venue. The first image shows coverage using eight cabinets of a traditional line array system. The contour lines represent 3 dB level changes. The system covers the room consistently, but variations in coverage are apparent. The second image shows eight Anya covering the same venue. The contour lines here essentially overlay the audience geometry. This again is a result of adaptive product source density and ability to produce the ideal vertical coverage pattern for the venue. For virtually any application, fewer adaptive modules are needed to achieve equivalent output and coverage when compared to traditional line arrays. Typically, vertical coverage needs dictate the number of cabinets in the array. Sources need to be pointed towards the area where audio coverage is needed. This is exaggerated the closer the arrays are to the audience areas. With adaptive arrays, the number of cabinets is primarily determined by output needs. Since a signal cabinet is capable of 180 degrees of coverage on its own, the system operator or designer can simply add modules until the desired SPL is achieved. This directly translates to reduced array weights, easier to manage sight lines, and a minimal visual impact. The images below compare an array of four ANA versus eight of a similarly sized traditional line array. Despite utilizing half as many cabinets, the N array produces higher SPL, is more consistent, and boasts an overall lower weight. Let's take a quick look into exactly how the adaptive algorithm works. In this example, we can see that the distance between the array and audience surfaces changes drastically between the closest points and the furthest points. At the closest point, the array is just 25 feet from the nearest audience surface, though at the back of the venue, the array is nearly 150 feet away. So how do adaptive products address this extreme difference in distance? Every time we double the distance from our sound source, we're going to lose about 6 dB. To compensate for this loss, the adaptive algorithm will weigh the audience areas and assign the appropriate number of cells. This means that if we compare our furthest point to our closest point, the furthest points will utilize the majority of the components in the array, with the closer areas utilizing only a small percentage. 
It's important to note that this type of allocation is not possible with the traditional line array. In this example, we're able to take hundreds of components and direct them at the furthest points in the venue to achieve a consistent result, all through software. To do this physically with a traditional array would not be possible given the physical constraints of the boxes themselves. As you can see on the slide, the result is nearly perfect coverage across all seating. To measure the predicted system response, Resolution will place virtual microphones within the venue and develop an average system response that is used as a baseline. This process is invisible to the user, and the microphones represented here are only shown to demonstrate what is happening in the background. Once a baseline response has been established, it's time to analyze and adjust to our target voicings. Let's watch a quick video to go over adaptive coverage in more detail. Today we'll be talking about how adaptive arrays calculate coverage and resolution and the changes we've made in version 2.8. Previously, coverage was calculated by surfaces directly in front of the arrays. With this new method, side surfaces that fall within the horizontal coverage pattern are now taken into account. Because the new method may change coverage and aiming lines on files using the original method, we've created a switchable option under Options than Adaptive Venue Detection. Narrow is the default when resolution first opens and represents the original method, and wide represents the updated method. Additionally, new options have been added to the view menu. By enabling show sweep lines, resolution will display a series of green lines indicating which sections of each surface are being covered. Upon enabling show venue detection, Resolution will populate a pink line representing how the venue is being calculated. Let's pull up our first model using narrow method. We'll be looking at a section of a stadium with part of the top bowl deselected as an audience area. Notice how the coverage starts and stops based only on vertical distance and height from surfaces directly in front of the array. This is further illustrated by observing aiming lines in ISO view. Using the same model and coverage, let's take a look at how the wide method calculates differently. Even though the specified coverage stops previous to the top of the bowl, you can see aiming lines are extended to compensate for surfaces off to the side. The green sweep lines indicate which part of the surface is being calculated. Coverage may also be extended beyond the specified start and end values. Let's open up a new model and take a look. To access coverage extension, select the array at the column level and scroll down to the bottom of the properties window. No extension will mean coverage will be exactly equal to what is configured in resolution. Choosing hard, medium, soft, respectively 0, negative 3, and negative 6 dB, we'll pick a target SPL in the center of coverage, then extend that 0, negative 3, and negative 6 dB to the start and stop of coverage. This will then alter the aiming lines to extend past the coverage area to attain a more even performance. Also notice how the pink line changes as extension values are modified. This is the visual representation of the venue detection we discussed earlier that shows how resolution is calculating the venue. Okay, so let's say for example that the orange trace shown in the figure seen here represents the measured response from our model above, and our desired system response or target voicing is shown as the red trace. You'll notice that there is a buildup of energy centered at 150 Hz. This is a common occurrence if you have a multi-column array of an adaptive product. Low frequency energy will sum constructively between the two columns, resulting in a buildup of energy in this range. Because we can model and predict this behavior, we can also correct for it automatically. In this case, resolution will compare the measured response to the target response, calculate, and then implement the optimal filter needed to match the measured response to the target. This result is a system that is show-ready and essentially pre-tuned substantially reducing the system optimization time. 
high-frequency air loss is also taking place. Significant attenuation to high frequency of a sound system occurs when that system is used over extreme distances. We call this effect air loss. To combat this and provide the best possible high frequency response for a given condition, EAW employs an automatic air loss compensation algorithm in its adaptive products. Air loss is linear with distance, meaning as distance increases, so will air loss at a linear rate. To demonstrate the effects of air loss, let's look at a basic example. This image shows the effects of air loss at different distances. We've also normalized the response to a meter. This allows us to compare the effects of high frequency attenuation introduced by air loss more clearly. You'll notice that the effects of air loss close to the sound source of 50 feet and 100 feet are quite subtle, though as distance increases, the effects become quite dramatic and have a significant impact on the tonal balance of a sound system. Here we can see the result of applying air loss preemphasis. The red trace is representative of the air loss we will encounter at 400 feet from the source. The brown trace shows the preemphasis boost that will be applied, and the orange trace is the result of applying that boost to the red trace. So that's a quick take on adaptive and how it works. Let's move on now to discuss the newest member of adaptive, AC6. So what is AC6? AC6 is an acoustically powerful and architecturally elegant adaptive column loudspeaker fit for portable and installation applications when high-performance music amplification is required. Taking a look at the highlights, its frequency response can go down to 65 Hz, which means it's capable of full music playback. It has fully customizable coverage using adaptive technologies. It has an IP54 rating, meaning it can be deployed anywhere. It's clean and visually appealing. It's easy to install into service, and it's ruggedized for portable use applications. Going over the three W's, the why, what, and where. So why does this product exist? Typical column loudspeakers sacrifice power in order to meet aesthetic needs. We felt this shouldn't be the case. AC6 is able to produce powerful musical sound from a compact package that will satisfy most cosmetic specs. We felt this product did not exist anywhere in our industry. What is different about this product? Competitive products require additional low-frequency speakers, such as subwoofers, to be added to the system in order to achieve any type of musical performance. With AC6's frequency response being 65 Hz to 20 kHz, this is no longer a requirement. Additionally, with traditional beam steering products, there may be a limit to the frequency range that can be controlled or a limit to the maximum angle of steering. AC6 is 90 degrees up and down using adaptive coverage throughout the whole frequency response. Horizontally, it covers a wide area with a 120 degree dispersion pattern. And where should AC6 be used? It has been designed with portable and fixed install applications in mind. It should be considered for both voice only and musical applications where the loudspeaker needs to blend better into its surroundings. So this could make sense anywhere from a church to a performing arts center to a large outdoor stadium. Taking a look at the specifications, AC6 can achieve a high max SPL at 143 dB at a 12 dB crest factor. Like our other adaptive products, this unit is driver dense. Each component has its own amp and DSP channel. With six low frequency transducers and 30 high frequency transducers, this allows for 36 channels to be controlled and manipulated separately. This amount of control leads to enhanced directivity, which increases intelligibility. Using IR sensors on the top and bottom of the cabinet, additional units can be added and will communicate with each other as one source, which only increases directivity and sound control. An indefinite amount of AC6 can be arrayed together. As mentioned before, AC6 can go down to 65 Hz. This is much lower than our competition's products. This translates to impressive music playback never heard before in a column array. Let's take a moment to look at AC6's acoustic module. Each AC6 consists of three separate acoustic modules. Each module and its components are serviceable from the front of the unit. This means you will not have to take AC6 down from an install in order to perform service in the field. This gets you back up and running quicker when damaged hardware does need to be replaced. Turning AC6 around, there are a few talking points. First, it's equipped with 28 flytrack mounting points that are not only compatible with EAW rigging, but also many third-party accessory options as well. This makes AC6 easy to deploy. There are two connection plates, AC mains for input and AC loop for loop through. AC6 utilizes the Brooklyn chip with primary and secondary inputs and loop throughs to connect other AC6s or Dante enabled devices. Both Dante Audio and EAW Control are passing through these ports. If you have not done so, 
we recommend going to Audinate's website, audinate.com, and taking their level one and level two courses. This will prime you for how flexible and powerful this technology can be. There are also two independent analog and AES inputs with loop throughs as well. And in any case, AC6 can be mounted upside down if you need these inputs to be on the top. There are also several copper to copper connections presented on both panels. This allows for a variety of signals to be passed through the arrays. There's also support for a configurable input override port. This allows the input source to be changed by a contact closure or a third party system in response to a fault or in an emergency. Lastly, Nutric True One top power connectors provide a locking, low impedance connection to the main source. There is also a loop through for power as well. There are several options for AC6 accessories. There's a pole mount, there's a wall mount flush bracket, there's a wall mount pan bracket, there's a truss clamp bracket, and lastly, weather protection covers. Taking a look at the pole mount, using a KM adapter, it's as simple as removing two bottom screws from AC6 then attaching the mount using provided screws with the adapter. From there, the adapter will fit on all common speaker stands. There's currently no solution for mounting two AC6 on a pole, but this is something we're working on. Taking a look at the flush mount wall bracket, this can be installed facing either the left or right direction or in the up position. Match the cabinet bracket position on the fly track so that it may slide into the wall bracket. It's important if you are installing more than one AC6 in the array that you note the fly track positions as they will need to match each cabinet identically. This bracket is meant to disappear. So once on the wall, only a small portion of the bracket is visible from the side. There's no way to tilt or aim AC6 when you're using this option. Looking at the pan bracket, the wall bracket can be mounted in two different orientations and the cabinet bracket can be mounted on either side of the fly track. It's important to note both so that attaching both brackets is seamless. This option will allow you to aim the speaker left or right. There is also an optional cosmetic cover that can be ordered for a cleaner look after AC6 is panned, which is illustrated by the right image. For mounting multiple AC6 in a vertical array, whether the pan bracket or the flush bracket, we have a template you can use to mark the positions that should be implemented so that all AC6 line up correctly and there is no communication issues due to varied distances between the IR sensors. The AC6 Stinger seen here is not available yet, but will be in the future. This accessory ships and connects with the flush mount cabinet bracket and allows you to suspend AC6 using a shackle. AC6 utilizes an IP54 weather rating. This means AC6 can be used anywhere. Unprotected powered loudspeakers can easily be damaged by moisture, light rain, or other unpredictable elements. AC6 has an extruded aluminum chassis, stainless steel mesh protected front grille, hydrophobic fabric, and conformal coated electronics to allow it to operate in any weather conditions an audience will be able to withstand. EAW can supply an optional weather shield that fits over both connection plates. Each kit will have two weather shields with the gaskets and screws needed to attach it to the cabinet which you can see in the top left. As seen on the bottom right, a joint cover can also be ordered, which can be used in the center of the array if multiple AC6 is being deployed. This would be used to connect from the top of one AC6 to the bottom of the one above it. AC6 was designed with cosmetics in mind. Currently, it's available in black and white on top of its clean looking industrial design. Custom colors will be an option in the future as specified project to project. Though not available now, we can assist with instructions on how to paint the cabinets if a custom color is needed for a design. Flexibility in color allows AC6 to integrate its powerful sound into any room with a minimal visual impact. AC6 is using six core EAW technologies. Each one is integral to its acoustic performance. Adaptive performance integrates nearly every aspect of the loudspeaker, mechanical, electrical, and acoustical design. This is the same technology we use in the larger Anna and Anya speakers. Concentric Summation Array, or CSA, is a method of seamlessly integrating mid-frequency and high-frequency components within a single horn. With CSA, multiple subsystems sum coherently without interruption to either high-frequency or mid-frequency wavefronts. Beamwidth match crossovers are carefully designed high-frequency horns and crossovers meant to eliminate polar irregularities through the crossover point. 
Focusing is advanced DSP used to perfect the impulse response of a loudspeaker in the time domain by eliminating horn honk and splashiness. Dyno, or dynamic optimization, dynamic EQ, actively tracks the input spectrum and power delivery, continually maximizing output and fidelity at any drive level. This is in place to ensure you get every dB of performance out of your system. And lastly, symmetry of sources is a symmetrical arrangement of acoustic sources along a common axis, creating consistency throughout the coverage pattern. Earlier we touched on driver density and how it affects the directivity of AC6. This is one of its major strengths. With 36 channels of amplification and DSP in one cabinet, you can control where sound goes better than ever before. As you can see on the slide, the more AC6 added to an array, the more directivity and control exists. Here we have a venue with a floor and two balconies being covered by an array of three AC6. The first slide is both balconies unselected as an audience area, the second slide is only the top balcony disabled, and the last slide is the full venue. This is a good representation of how AC6 and all adaptive products allocate cells. The same hang can have multiple configurations, all managed through resolution. Each configuration could also be saved as a preset to be recalled later, so switching between covering the floor only to the balconies is as easy as loading these settings saved from an earlier time. This could either be done through Resolution Preset Manager or from the back of the unit using the jog wheel and display. So, Resolution is the modeling and control software for all EAW products. This will be the best tool to determine how AC6 will perform in an acoustical space. It's possible to import section, elevation, and plan drawings to build your model more accurately and quicker. After AC6 is inserted into the project, there are various tools that can be used to manipulate coverage in the space. Once you're live with the product in the field, you'll be able to connect to each array on the Dante network, or simply the control network, and make live changes to the coverage and DSP. The system will be monitored regularly for potential issues, a function we refer to as system health, and will allow you to heal around any hardware issues that may be occurring, leaving the faulty components out of the cell allocation. So now I'm going to switch screens and walk you through the basics of using resolution. Okay, so let me walk you through the basics of using resolution. The first thing I like to verify is that it's configured the way that it works best for me. So in this case, I like to have my Project Explorer window open, my Properties window open, and Array View. If you're opening this for the first time, you'll notice that the Properties window and the Project Explorer window is on your right. I've moved this over to the left. This is a preference that um, a preference that I've developed over over the years, but if you wanted to move windows around, you can click on them on the on the menu or the title bar, and then just drag them around left to right, and place them where you would like. If you are missing a window or would like to add a window, you can do so under View. So if you go to View, uh, say you want to add link groups, click Link Groups. You can resize it by clicking on the, the title bar, dragging it up or down. It's fighting me for whatever reason. You click up or down. And then if you want to close out of any window, just simply click the X at the top right. Next, you want to make sure your measurement units are correct. So under, under uh, Tools, sorry, so under Options, you have SI units, which is metric, and US units, which is feet. We'll stick with feet. And lastly, if you want to import a drawing, so resolution allows you to import a drawing and then build the, build the acoustic model over the top. Up on the screen is a link to a YouTube video that walks you through step-by-step -step how to do that. But quickly, if you go to File and Import Drawing, this allows you to import a drawing and then using the ruler length under size, uh, assuming that it's scaled, allows you to set the scale and then position allows you to select the X, Y, zero, essentially the X, Y axis zero. And then you can uh, select where you want to import it, whether it's top view, side view, or front view, and then you can click accept. And that will place that drawing in your project and you can continue to build the model on top of that imported drawing. So let's go to our plan view here. And the first thing I do is this original or initial surface has a front of house, um, like a front of house indicator. I typically don't use that 
feel free to use that as you would like. It's, it's attached to the surface, so you can't move it around the venue. You can only move it around the surface. For that reason, I, I typically find myself not using that. So the first thing I'll do is I'll go into venue and I'll add another surface, which I just did there. I clicked that plus, that plus, uh, plus symbol, which added another surface. And then I go back to the original surface and I remove it. Yes, I want to remove it. And then the next thing I do is I rename this to floor. This will be our floor. All right. So now we want to set the dimensions of this initial surface. So let's say this is 80 feet long and 30 wide. Um, this also has a rake or an incline. So click back to side view and I'm going to add a 3% incline. You can see it applied there. I'm gonna click back over to the plan view and I'm going to assume that the Y or I'm going to assign the Y to be the edge of the front of the stage. So there's about, in this case, we'll say there's about five feet between the edge of the stage and when the coverage area starts. All right, perfect. So I'm going to construct a fan-shaped room with a balcony. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to clone this initial surface and I'm going to just hit offset, not change anything. I'm going to place the new surface right over the top of the initial surface. Then I'm going to click on that surface and drag it out and holding down the alt key, I'm going to scroll up. In this case, I'm going to scroll up. Then I'm going to match up the top corners. All right, I'm going to do the same exact thing two more times. There. So now we have half of the floor built essentially. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to complete the floor by right-clicking, clone surface. Now I'm just going to mirror on the x-axis, okay? There, now we have the floor built. Next, let's tackle the balcony. So I'm going to add another surface, and I'm going to say this is about uh, Z is your height. I'm going to say Z, uh, or the height of the from the bottom of the balcony to the floor is about 15 feet. Then I'm going to place this, then I'm going to place this in position, say about right there, and for ease of this model, I'm going to make the width the same as the floor. So this is going, this balcony is going to be symmetrical with the floor. We'll say it's 30 wide. And I'm going back to the section view. And I'm going to add another incline. So you can also do this by clicking and, and dragging up. So let's say that looks good. It's about, we'll say it's actually a 20, 20 degree incline go back to plan view. So now we're going to do the exact same thing we did with the floor. I'm going to right click, clone, offset over the top of the existing surface, OK. And then I'm going to drag this out. And what I like to do if I know it's symmetrical is I'll zoom in, hold down the Alt key, and then I'll line it up with the same angle that's on the floor. So I'll do that. And so I'll need to change this width a little bit. I'm gonna change it to about 40. Bring this up a little bit here. All right, so I'm gonna do this again. I'm gonna do this two more times.
All right. So mimicking exactly what I did with the floor, once more, I'm going to right click, clone on the X axis. And if you've caught this, I have forgotten to name the balcony surfaces. Um, so I'll have to go back and do that later, but I will do that for the clones now. So always important to rename your surfaces so you know um, what they are when it comes time to maybe make a change later. And there is our venue, or our floor and our balcony. Last step would be to add a stage. Um, so I'll keep this pretty simple. Um, we'll name the stage. We'll set the Z, say it's a three foot stage. Uh, it's about 25 feet long. Therefore the X would be negative 25, so that's the edge of the stage lining up. Uh, for the sake of time, I'll keep this pretty simple. I'll just do this once, clone surface, offset. Drag this over. Okay. And clone that. So there is our venue. What I'd like to do next is change the ear height. In most cases, if you model for the floor, it's not really a true representation of how the audience will be listening to the source. So. I like to go before, once I know the model's done, I'll go to Tools, Set Ear Height, Seated. And then what I'll do, now that everything's seated, is I'll select each surface in the venue by just clicking the first one listed, holding down Shift, and then I'll lock them all. This allows me to now move about, and I won't accidentally move any of these surfaces if I click on them. It won't allow me to. Perfect, so now the venue's built. The next step would be to add an array. In this case, since we're going over AC6, let's add a couple AC6s, huh? Um, we'll call this house right, two AC6s. So we're in the array assistant. So this will make recommendations for the system it feels is best for the venue. Um, you can always make changes to any of these parameters later. This is just a starting point for you. Um, I like to set this minimum, minimum trim to zero so it doesn't catch me later. Um, if anything tries to go below 10 feet, even if it's not the top of the array, it won't allow you to. And sometimes you'll change your height and not realize that it didn't apply properly. I'll go next. And I'll modify coverage. Again, you can change this once you're once it's added. This is something you can change under properties. And I'll allow tilt. I will say I want maximum SPL. And then once I'm done here, I'll click finish. This is going to drop AC6 in my project. Let's scroll in a bit. So now what I want to do is I want to place this in position. So I'll click on AC6 and holding the shift key. Holding the shift key allows me to move this freely. If I wasn't holding the shift key, I'd be locked to one of the axes. So holding the shift key allows me to move this freely. I'm going to move it to the edge of the stage or the side of the stage. And then next I will modify my coverage. So right now I have the coverage set to go all the way out to about 130 feet. I want to change that. Actually, let me rename this array to house right. First, I want to change that so I can do so either by clicking on this little blue dot here and dragging it in. You can also change the coverage here under properties. So here I have 120 feet, let's set to 120. And then let's, you know, let's keep it at five feet. Um, let's also change the height of this array. So right now we have it at about 11. Let's change that to 15 feet. And let's change the tilt to negative 5. So taking a quick look at what we have here, that's how our AC6 right now is, is deployed. 
All right. So with our with our speaker now with our speaker in position, let's add a couple of microphones. You can do that by double clicking anywhere on any of these surfaces. It's going to place a microphone. We'll do this quickly here. All right. All right. And so now you have two two options up here at the top. You have mic SPL and regular SPL. Mic SPL is just going to calculate and display the values of each microphone, whereas if you clicked on SPL, it's going to do a full SPL mapping. So sometimes if you're looking for just a quick prediction, mic SPL might be the better choice. So you'll get that result a lot quicker. Um, you want to make sure you're mapping for the right pass band. Right now, I like to start with one octave 4K. You have various options here. You can do broadband, um, uh, A-weighted, C-weighted, um, you have multiple pass bands to choose from. Let's stick with one octave 4K. And also you want to make sure your range is set properly. As it is now, if you were to map with this range here, it would not be a, a correct representation of what's actually happening in the venue. It would, it would be a green, uh, one big green map. So you want to dial this in. Usually the max range I would do is 30. Um, so you want to set that somewhere in between 20 to 30. Let's do 75 to 100. And this way when it maps, it's going to map, um, it's going to give an accurate representation of, of how, how the system is performing in the space. To look at that even further, uh, to look at 3 dB increases, decreases, you can also go to view again and then select contour lines. So this along with mapping will give you a really accurate representation of how the system is performing in the space. Some additional tools, let's say that you want to send more energy to the back of the balcony. Um, click on your array. I'm just going to give myself a little bit more room here. Uh, click on the array and then scroll down a bit. And you will see you have extend from, or extend front rather, and extend rear coverage, extend front coverage, extend rear coverage. And this allows you to adjust how the cells are being allocated. So as it is now, it's, it's extending coverage 3 dB past the balcony and past the front, as we've specified um, when we modified the coverage. Let's switch this to no extension and then medium. So what this will do is there's no extension past the front coverage, but I'm allowing extension past the balcony, so I should get more cells allocated towards the back of the balcony. Um, so a little bit more long distance throw and taking away a little bit of what's in the near field. I did cover a lot of this in the video earlier in the presentation, but again, I'm putting the link to that video on the screen if you wanted to watch it again. That explains exactly uh, what's happening with this extend coverage. Another option you have here is override Z. So what this does is this allows you to select a start and end elevation point, essentially. So let's say you could also do this by um, deselecting each odd or deselecting each floor surface as an audience area. Um, this is an easier and quicker way to do that. So let's say you only wanted to calculate the balcony. Um, you, we know the balcony is at 15 feet, so let's set the start Z at 15, and let's set the end Z at 32. So what this is going to do is it's going to ignore any surfaces that aren't in that range. So we'll wait for this to calculate, and you'll watch, watch these, watch these lines just change trajectory so that they're only pointing at the balcony. So that's a way, if you only wanted to cover the balcony, that's another way other than deselect or deselecting surfaces as audience areas, that's another way to accomplish that. I'm going to turn that off for now. And so I'm talking about deselecting audience areas. It's a good idea to do this with the stage, unless you wanted the stage to be part of the coverage area. It could potentially throw off how the cells are being allocated if you don't do so. So usually what I'll do is I'll go to the stage, 
just right click and deselect them as audience areas. That way it doesn't throw off the calculations. So with that said, you're, you're pretty much, you've, you've got your system, you get your system inserted, you know your venue's correct. Let's go ahead and clone house right and call it house left. There you go. And then you can add a sub if you would like. I'm just going to do an SB828. Pairs well with the, with the AC6s. I'm going to ground stack at center. Might make more sense for you to treat it as one as close to one source as possible, so you could also put it underneath the AC6s. I'm just going to leave it center, keep it simple for now. And then from there, it's going to calculate and map with adaptive and AC6. It's going to take a while, and we'll make you wait for this to map. Um, but at this point, you're just waiting for the mapping to make sure that the coverage looks good, and if it does, you know you're ready to deploy the system. Now, the final step would be to connect. You can now take this and use this as the control for your AC6 system. So you can take this out in the field. You can click on our network um, network configuration view, um, connect, and then with, when a device is online, you're able to drag it and drop it over your pre-designed system. I'm not going to go through this now. I'm not connected to an AC6, but again, up on the screen is another link to watch a video that explains how to do this. So click on that link, and that will give you, a, and this will give you a better understanding of how to go online with an adaptive system, or even a Radius system or NTX system. It, it's it's the same. It, it's generally the same for all of our products. Um, so with that said, that is a quick look at resolution, and back to the presentation view. Okay, so that was a run through on resolution. To learn more about adaptive technology please visit education.eaw.com and take our certified adaptive training. I recommend you do this prior to using AC6. This dives deeper into the technology being used and will better help you understand what is actually happening inside this cabinet. It has six separate modules and will take just under an hour to complete. Any further questions you have on AC6 or adaptive or resolution in general, please reach out to myself or anyone in the applications team at design at eaw.com. There are also various tools and references available for download. For documentation, we have a spec sheet, which is an overview of the product's capabilities, a user manual, which is an in-depth look at all acoustic and electronic functions of AC6, accompanied with a detailed explanation of all accessories available, and lastly, a quick start guide, which will walk you through the steps of getting the system up as efficiently as possible. We also have various tools for designers. We have an AC6 2D and 3D CAD drawing, an AC6 Revit file with wall bracket, an AC6 SketchUp file, a flush mount bracket 2D drawing, a panable wall bracket 2D drawing, and then the Stinger 2D drawing. And lastly, here's our team. There's myself. I am the EAW Technical Training Manager. There's Jonas Domkis, who is the Technical Sales Manager for the West, and then John Mills, who's the Technical Sales Manager for the East. There's also James Newhouse, who is VP of Global Sales, and James Banlett, who is our APAC Sales Manager. All five of us will be available to assist you with any AC6 projects and opportunities.